We are exceptionally uh, proud that we can uh, welcome to K101 Radio in the morning show our uh, brand new United States Senator James Langford. Uh, Senator, good morning. How are you? Good morning to you. Boy, well, you sound with you. you sound like you're <laughs> right here in the studio with us. <laughs> That'd be a lot more fun than where I am. I'm actually in my office in Washington D.C. I can tell you. The air is a lot better in, in Woodward than it is here. <laughs> did you uh, did you find it much of a transition uh, to move from a uh, congressman to the Senate side of the uh, Capitol? It is, actually. What's funny is a lot of people would think you're just moving from the south side of the building to the north side of the building. It shouldn't be that big of an issue. Uh, but, for instance, I'm in transitional office space still. I'm nine weeks into the Senate, and I still don't have my office yet. I won't have it until probably late May, early June well, it takes six it, months for them just to get office space set up over here. It's kind of embarrassing. Well, now, did Coburn, was he that ruckus? <laughs> <laughs> no, Dr. Coburn wasn't like a rock star leaving a hotel or anything. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. The whole place up, but, uh, they're just that slow to be able to move here. Where they, in the House, when you move into the House the very first day, every single House member, when they're elected the first day, they move in their office. Right. In the Senate, it takes them almost six months to move people into their office space. And uh, it's is, just that slow. So welcome to the United States Senate. I was going to say, is there an explanation for that? Is well, there... they actually what they do is the first day after the election, uh, there were 13 people that left the Senate last year uh, that aren't back this year, including obviously Dr. Coburn. And so what they do is the first day of the new Senate, they'll go to the senior most member and they'll say there are 13 offices open. Do you want to move to one of them? And they'll have all day to look oh, at it okay. and decide. And then they'll say, no, I don't want to move. I'm going to stay. Then the next day, they'll go to the next person. They've got all day to look. So that's 100 people right there. And then once they decide, then they take a couple of weeks to, you know, kind of get everything set up and start moving people. And it's just the chaos of it. Well, uh, do you rely on uh, the uh, senior senator from Oklahoma when you first move over there? I mean, the Republicans haven't owned the Senate for several years. So how did you kind of get acclimated as to what you should be doing or not doing? And, and, and tell us what, what committees you're on as well. I am. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jim Inhofe and I obviously have a good relationship on it, and we'll have a lot of interaction back and forth. He's setting up a new committee right now as well. He's the new chairman of a committee called the Environment and Public Works. So all highways, all environmental policy, everything has to come through his committee where he's chairman now. So he's in the process of setting that up. Part of the benefit of Republicans taking the Senate over is that now we have a chairman uh, from Oklahoma that's leading out one section of the Senate. Uh, for me, I'm on the Appropriations Committee, which handles all the spending, and I've got five different subcommittees on that. Uh, I'm on the Homeland Security Governmental Affairs, which is the oversight committee uh, for the Senate. Uh, and then I have uh, two other committees, Indian Affairs, uh, which is good for an Oklahoman to be on that committee, obviously, with 39 tribes. Uh, and then my final committee is the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, so that's all things intelligence worldwide will come through that committee. Well, is that like being in armed services? Do you know everything that's going on? I mean, is that what that's, that committee does? I don't know everything that's going on, but I have access to everything that's going on. How about that? Uh, there's only one that knows everything, and that's God. And, okay. Uh, so <laughs> he'll, he'll, he'll take care of that. But. The, the, the responsibility that I have is to be able to oversee the intelligence community, and we have several intelligence agencies. I mean, people are used here in CIA and NSA, but there are other agencies that are out there that also do satellite photography and other things uh, that help us worldwide uh, outside of the United States. Now, these are not folks that are looking in on Americans. These are folks that are literally gathering intelligence worldwide to try to help protect us. They're gathering information about terrorism worldwide uh, and about terrorist networks, uh, they're working with other governments that hate us, uh, like Iran and North Korea and others, trying to be able to track what they're doing and what they're planning and trying to stay attentive to those things. Well, now, why do you say that Iran hates us when you've got a president of the United States and a secretary of state that's negotiating with Iran over, uh, you know, enriched nuclear weaponry or whatever <laughs> they call it? Well, I would tell you that the leadership of Iran is not real favorable to the United States. Since about 1979, as you guys know well, uh, in the transition of the Iranian uh, revolution that happened there, uh, their Islamic leadership there is pretty radical. Uh, they are the single largest state sponsor of terror worldwide. I mean, they are number one above North Korea, above anybody else. They sponsor Hamas. They sponsor Hezbollah. They're sponsoring a lot of the work that's happening in Syria right now. 
Am I missing something here? But uh, Netanyahu uh, just spoke to the uh, Congress of the United States. Is he the only one that's worried about what you just said? No, I think there are quite a few other Americans that are worried about it as well. Uh, We've had a pretty strong support. In fact, we just sent an open letter that a lot of people have have poked at us for uh, to the leadership of Iran, saying we're we're aware our president is working to be able to make an agreement, but you need to also understand that he'll be out of office in two years, and this is an agreement that needs to come through the Congress, that needs to be ratified by Congress, so you can have the full support of the American people on board with any agreement that happens. But, yes, there's there's a real concern. This is not a partisan issue. Republicans and Democrats alike have real concern that if Iran gets a nuclear bomb, uh, that is serious consequences not just for Israel and for the individuals that are in that region, but for the world. I mean, if you're a sponsor of terrorism and you have nuclear material, uh, that becomes a serious issue for any person in the world. Well, now that you represent the entire state of Oklahoma, uh, do you... Does that consume more of your free time? And I don't mean to to, to make light of that. Uh, I know you have certain vacation time, but uh, do you feel that obligation to cover all the state and uh, visit with the folks about what they think? Yes, sir, I do, actually. Uh, I've been in uh, the Senate now since the 5th of January. I've only been home uh, one week uh, during that time period. We've been in session. I'm in Washington, D.C. again this week. So in the House of Representatives, it's typical for you to be in session three weeks in D.C., then one week back in your district, uh, and it kind of alternates back and forth. In the Senate, it's six weeks in D.C. and one week back in the district. And when I'm back in the state, uh, I travel all over the state. I did town hall meetings, for instance, in Altus last week, or or two weeks ago when I was back in. I was uh, in the Tulsa area. I'll be up in northwest and southeast uh, when I'm back in right around Easter time. Uh, So, yes, sir, uh, I do feel an obligation to get a chance to hear the voices all around the state because, surprisingly enough, not all Oklahomans think alike. And uh, so I want to get a chance to hear what our voices are around the state. Well, one of the things you have done in the past is head up the activities at Falls Creek. Uh, And I guess I have to ask, are you an ordained Baptist minister or were you just an administrator there? I, I was actually the administrator there, but I'm also a licensed pastor. Uh, so I've done weddings and funerals and was a youth pastor for years, but I've uh, been interim pastor at 12 different churches helping them in their transition. But yeah, for 15 years, I was at Falls Creek, and 13 of those years, I was the director there. Uh, my responsibilities there were teaching in the morning, but also the administrative part of what we did at camp all summer long. I can see how, as a United States Senator with the president that we currently have, how you would welcome God on your side. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would tell you, it's uh, I, Mitch McConnell, who is the, the leader of the Senate, uh, he and I were chatting two weeks ago, and he said, now, you were a minister before you came here, weren't you? And I said, yes, sir, I was. And he said, I think you're the only minister in the Senate. And I said, well, that's too bad. We need more. And he has to for a minute. He goes, this place does need a lot more prayer. That's probably not a bad idea to have a minister here. How do you... Uh, how do you get into doing things like well one thing that's very important to me and I think it is with you is that the United States needs to live within its means and we're in trillions of debt how do we rein that in yeah, if, you want to take the, if you want to take the, uh, the scriptural principle for that there are multiple examples of that all over the scripture but a clear proverb says that um, uh, the the um, uh, the debtor is a sl- uh, the debt owner is a slave to the debt lender uh, so, and you, a wise person passes his inheritance to his children's children, but we're actually spending the inheritance of our children's children right now. So we're violating every scriptural principle that's out there in the way that we spend. Well, ultimately, uh, my, doesn't that make our money worthless? I mean, doesn't that ultimately cave you in, I guess, is what... Don't it, is, it is long-term. What's ironic about it right now is so many other economies worldwide are in such bad shape that the dollar is stronger than any other currency worldwide right now. Uh, the European economy is in much worse shape than what we are in, uh, and so their their euro is continuing to collapse. The money in, in China, they're devaluating. The money in Japan, they're devaluating. So the dollar ends up being the strongest element. We're, we're, the, we're the strongest of the weak ones that are standing, if that makes sense. Our long-term issues, really, are, we're at right now $18 trillion in debt. That is the accumulated amount that we've got. So first things first, we've got to get us back to each year being a balanced budget, and we're almost half a trillion dollars out of balance still this year. 
uh, to get us back to a zero for we're we're spending what we bring in and then after that start paying down our debt. Uh, but there's no I'll tell you there's no magic bullet to this thing. There's no one year fix. Uh, this would be like uh, the difference between a couple of years ago our nation really had a car loan. Now we've got a big jumbo mortgage. Uh, you're not going to pay it off in one year. It's going to take several years to get on top of it. But we're trying to find agreement with other people here in Washington that even think that it's we should actually get back to balance. The um, uh, well, I've lost my oh uh, Ryan Stone. I'm sorry, Kelly. <laughs> I was doing something about recording what we're seeing here this morning. Uh, Ryan <laughs> Stone is part of our team here, along with Sean Kelly. Uh, we work together every morning, and I didn't ask them that they probably have some questions for you. Uh, yeah, I just uh, I read your um, I read your reaction or your statement on the uh, the Sigma Alpha Epsilon video at uh, the University of Oklahoma. I'm sure you've heard that two of those uh, kids on that bus have been expelled. I'm just uh, curious of your reaction to that and uh, if this is a freedom of speech issue in your opinion. It is both actually on it, and that that's the big challenge. You you are free in America to say any stupid thing you want to say, uh, and that that's that's still America that you have that opportunity to be able to say something dumb. Uh, but the immediate response from the fraternity saying this doesn't line up with the values of our fraternity, the immediate response of the university to say this doesn't line up with the values of the university are pretty swift and pretty strong. Now, I, I'm going to tell you, every person has the right to be able to speak what they want to speak. Now, when you take action on things, that becomes a different issue. Uh, but you have the right to be able to speak whatever you want to speak. But that doesn't mean also individuals that have association want to still be able to associate with you. So, for instance, their fraternity can step back and say, hey, if you, if you say that, if you do that, if you sing that, we don't want to be connected with you. You're free to do that in America. We're not going to take American citizenship away from you, but we're not going to have you associated with us because that's not what we believe. While we have a minute here, let's talk about your family. Now, you have a couple of daughters, in fact, uh, pretty cute daughters. I've, hey, I've met now. them both. <laughs> uh, did, I'm trying did, not to tell any of the boys around that they're cute. <laughs> well, did you move them with you to Washington, or are they back in Edmond? I did not. No, home home, home is Oklahoma, and that's, okay. that's where they're staying. So they're they're in the same, same church, same school, same house, same neighborhood. I wanted them to have some kind of stability. They're a senior in high school and a freshman in high school. And uh, this would be a really bad time to try to pick up and move them. And besides, for me, uh, our, our family motto is home is where your wife is. And uh, so ho- home is in Oklahoma because that's where she is, and I go home every single weekend. Well, have they were up there for your swearing in? I'm sure they, they were. were proud. They were. And it, ironically enough, my daughter's in an advanced placement U.S. government class. <laughs> that was just a one-semester class, and she missed the first day of her AP U.S. government class to be there for my swearing in in the U.S. Senate. Uh, thankfully, her government teacher gave her an excused absence for that one. <laughs> well, she probably learned something while she was in, in Washington. What do yeah. you think, uh, in terms of your committee assignments, you're going to come down with the uh, greatest uh, influence? You know, I think it's going to actually be an oversight. Uh, I, I chair a, commit, a subcommittee uh, in the oversight uh, area on regulatory affairs. Uh, that means every regulator in the federal government comes through my committee. Uh, and that is the big issue that we face right now as a nation, uh, is how do we handle regulations and these different agencies and the ideas that they have, and they just start imposing these regulations like they're law. We can't seem to get our arms wrapped around it or to be able to stop it. Uh, so that's my mission right now is to be able to handle that. So I've really got three issues I've got my eye on the ball on right now. That's our government debt. That's our regulatory state, what's happening with regulations, and national security. And I try to stay on top of all those. But the, the, the regulations will be, I, I hope, my biggest emphasis. Okay, a couple of questions. And one, in that position, do you have any influence over the, uh, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency where they're allowing now that a, a mud puddle out here in, in the street in front of our studio, if that water rolls into the North Canadian River that ultimately gets to the Mississippi River, that that's all navigable and therefore subject to regulation of the street out in front of me? I mean, isn't that about how absurd that is? Yes, sir, I do. That is called the Waters of the U.S. Rule, and I can tell you Jim Inhoff is all over that in his Committee on Environment and Public Works. I'm all over that one as well in my committee dealing with regulatory affairs. We're pushing back an administration that's literally inventing a new law. Uh, that the law clearly states if the, if the federal government has any responsibility, it's a navigable water. Now, you and I would say that means you can put a boat in it, 
and hopefully with a motor on it. To the next one rather than just be a low spot or a puddle right and say it occasionally gets wet that's not navigable water unless you're building a boat out of out of paper and trying to float it uh, but they're they're trying to say if it ever can get to navigable water then it's navigable water now the court has knocked that down once uh, we're trying to slow that down change that transition that and fight that off at the same time the courts will start the battle on it again as well I think the courts will knock it down again, but we're trying to knock it down beforehand. And we've won some of these battles. Like the ATF uh, a month ago stepped out and wanted to limit some ammunition and saying that they're going to take some ammunition off the market. Uh, Jim Inhofe and I both did a letter, both fought that back, and this past week we won. ATF backed off on it. So some of those we can push and win. Some of those take a lot longer than others, though. What um, I put this off here until late in this interview for a, kind of a good reason because I think it's the most interesting one in terms of the people who live in your state how do we control immigration and the problem without a president telling us how we're going to do it what's what's your take on that how do we fix the problem well that's a nice simple question right yeah right (laughs) (laughs) i I would say immigration is one of the most complicated issues uh, because it's been put off so long it's one of those things that the, the longer you don't deal with it, the worse it gets. It's kind of like pulling weeds out of the garden. Uh, if you just ignore it for a long time, the weeds get so bad, it's really tough to deal with. That's where we are right now. This has been ignored for decades, and it's getting really, really difficult to manage. Uh, so the the key issues I look at, and just where I come from on the immigration issues, I first look at it, I believe every person has created the image of God and has value and worth, every person worldwide. Uh, so I'm going to treat every person with respect. But I am also know that every nation has laws, and those laws are to be abided by in every nation. We have very clear laws, and if you're going to deal with immigration issues, we've got to deal with it in law. It can't be an executive order from the president, uh, because that's not predictable. That's not something that can be planned. Uh, it's got to be actually in law, so we know that folks are following the law. Uh, three weeks ago, the president did a um, town hall meeting in Florida, and in that town hall meeting, he was asked, uh, about his executive action he did last year trying to legalize about 5 million people. Now, the court has kicked that out, and it said he can't act on that now. So he was asked in the town hall meeting, now what? Will we be deported um, uh, because this court has now ruled what your action was was not consistent with law? And his response was, no, the law enforcement folks have to follow my policy, and there will be consequences if they don't. Well, I, I wrote a letter to the president and said, help me understand this, that the people who break the law won't face consequences, but the people who actually enforce the law will face consequences. Right. It's this murky area that no one knows what to take on it. So I, I, I push pretty hard to say Congress does need to act to pass immigration reform. We've got to do it. We've got to do it the right way. We've got to be able to honor law, and we've got to be able to make this clear and consistent. Uh, Oklahomans want that. I found a lot of people nationwide that want that. It doesn't need to be executive action. It needs to be law. It needs to be done the right way, starting with border security. We should be able to know who's coming into our, our nation. That doesn't mean we don't let anyone in. We do. Uh, we still should have work permits and other ways to be able to come in to be able to work in the United States. But we need to know who they are and where they're from and who their family is and to be able to know that you're not a citizen of the United States just because you crossed the border into the United States. Well, we won't ask you to answer this uh, question I'm about to answer now or ask you now, but uh, in our uh, interviews, and by the way, folks, the senator has agreed to do a regular uh, monthly show here on K101 Radio, and uh, we just think that's enormously important for you as a voter out there to know what your United States senator is doing and the uh, transparency with which uh, he operates your Senate office in Washington, D.C. With that, I will tell you that in the future, Senator, we're probably going to want to know who you're supporting for President of the United States and for Vice President. <laughs> you know what? I can tell you right now, I don't know yet. I'm still looking at the field. I can tell you, it's not Hillary Clinton. I've okay. already, already made that decision. <laughs> That's good. Uh, but uh, I have not decided anyone from there. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of watching the field and kind of keeping my powder dry at this moment, kind of checking everybody out. Well, I assume it be, would be a Republican, but there is a Democrat out of Virginia, Webb, I think his name, that's, that yes. has some appealing thoughts and has been active in the United States government. So we'd be interested in what you think about him and all the other candidates when we talk here in a month or so. You bet. Glad to be able to do that. We promise your staff will let you go at 9 o'clock Eastern time, and we're right up on that now. So, again, Senator, thank you very much for being here on the morning show at K101. You're K101.